Well, it's amazing what we can talk ourselves out of, isn't it? You ever see a, a kid who's decided that he or she doesn't like something without even trying it first? You know, like certain kinds of food. You tell them to eat their food, and they say, well, I don't like that. And so you ask them, well, how do you know you don't like it if you've never tried it? And they say, well, I don't know. I just don't like it. Because they've talked themselves out of liking it without even giving it a chance. When my kids were little, uh, Avery was before she was born, when the boys were little, we had this big table in our dining room, this big farm table that we would sit around together every evening and eat dinner. And about twice a week, we would have green beans with our meal because we like green beans and they're healthy. And so the way it would usually go is we would all finish dinner and our plates would all be clean except on Coleman's plate, there would be this perfectly untouched pile of green beans. And so the way it worked is we would say, Coleman, we're going into the living room now, and when your plate is clean, you can join us in the living room. And we would get up and walk out and go into the living room. And a few minutes later, Coleman would come walking out with a clean plate, put it in the sink, and come into the living room. And that went on for a good two years at least. And then one morning, I was looking for my keys, and I was running through the house kind of panicked because I was late and I couldn't find my keys, and I had torn the house apart and searched everywhere. And in frustration, I'm walking through the house, and as I'm going through the dining room, I look down at the dining room table, and I realize in that dining room table that we had on each end, there was a drawer. And I guess it was for keeping silverware in. We didn't use them. But I thought, you know, maybe one of the kids grabbed my keys and stuck them in one of those drawers because Avery, my daughter, now will do that. She'll hide things to be funny. So I pull open the drawer on the end of the table where I sat, and it's empty. So I walk around to the op opposite side of the table where Coleman always sat when we were having dinner. And you know it's coming, right? I pull the drawer open. And from side to side and front to back and bottom to top, packed in as tightly as possible were two years of dried green beans. <laughs> packed in. A, that kid hadn't eaten a green bean in two years. And uh, it, I'm happy to report today he eats his green beans. He also loves broccoli. So we got past that point. But for two years there, he wasn't eating a green bean because he'd convinced himself that he really didn't like them. But I think that's what we do sometimes, isn't it? When we, we talk ourselves out of things even before we try them. And I think, honestly, a lot of Christians are that way with God. He calls us to something, something uh, that seems bigger uh, than us, because it is. But instead of answering that call, instead of doing what he's called us to do, we decide it's not for us. We talk ourselves out of it before we even give it a chance I think looking for something that maybe feels a bit more manageable or a bit more appealing to us. But the problem with that approach to life for the Christian is when God calls us to something, it's always bigger than what we can manage on our own. It always involves risk. There is always an element of unknown. It is always bigger than us. You know, God never calls people to safe manageable, predictable, risk-free lives. He doesn't. His disciples lived on the razor's edge because they had to if they had any hope of fulfilling the calling on their lives. Even the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, after asking Jesus what he had to do to have eternal life and then explaining that he'd lived very righteously, Jesus said to him in verse 21, sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Notice what Jesus did not say. He didn't say, and once you do that, once you sell everything and give to the poor and follow me, you'll be safe and secure without any hardship, without any risk, without any lack, without any trouble, without any struggles. He didn't say that. He simply said, give up everything that you've insulated your life with. Everything that makes you feel secure. Everything that seems sure and predictable, just go ahead and give all of that away and come follow me, Jesus said, without any further comment to the man. In fact, the only guarantee for that man was eternal life with Christ after this life, which is as good as it gets, of course. But notice Jesus didn't address what would happen to that man for the remainder of this life if he chose to follow him. 
And so what did the rich man do? He, he walked away sad. Why? Because he wasn't even willing to try. He'd made up his mind that he couldn't risk it all for Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the, the German theologian and pastor, once wrote, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. You see, when God calls you, he's not calling you to something that costs you nothing. He's not calling you to something that you can manage on your own. That's why we are all, every single one of us, called into the body of Christ, the church, because we need each other. He's not calling you to something convenient or easy or safe or predictable. In fact, I'll tell you what, if you believe that you can please God without ever taking a risk for the sake of the gospel, then you are mistaken. And yet there are a lot of people, there are a lot of believers who are so risk averse, so unwilling to even try what God has called them to if the outcome appears to be the least bit questionable, that they go through life attempting to insulate themselves from risk, from unknown variables, believing that they're being responsible when in truth they're being disobedient to the call of God in their lives. Okay? We're not always pleasing God by playing it safe. We're not. We're not always pleasing God when we play it safe. We please God by being obedient to his calling on our lives, which always involves some measure of risk. And so the question is, how do we stay focused on the goal and our calling to work toward that goal instead of these other earthly distractions? How do we accept the fact that the calling of God is a dangerous calling? At times it is fraught with risk. It can be utterly unpredictable and wholly unmanageable without faith in Him and help from others. Because answering the call of God on your life will without exception, it will require you to exercise faith in Him and to seek help from others at times, which is, by the way, the only way that we can ever please Him. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So when we're given an opportunity to use the gifts and talents that God gave us to further His kingdom, to do His work, His gospel work, but the outcome may be unpredictable and the cost is steep and the potential risk significant. We can choose to focus on all of those things, all of the voices that tell us why we shouldn't or why we can't or why we're being irresponsible. Or, like the runner in the video, we can shut out all of those voices and instead press on toward the goal. You see, because at the end of the day, it all comes down to what we are focused on. If you find yourself consistently backing away from the call of God on your life, it may be, as the Apostle Paul put it, that your mind is set on earthly things. In other words, maybe you've allowed earthly things, other voices, to distract you to the point that your life has become out of focus. Okay, If you're more focused on the risk than you are on the goal, then your life is out of focus. If you're more focused on the cost than you are in the goal, then your life is out of focus. If you're more focused on the distractions, the voices telling you why you can't or why you shouldn't pursue that calling, then you are on the goal, then your life is out of focus. The rich young ruler was more focused on what he stood to lose than what he stood to gain. His mind was set on earthly things, which meant his life was out of focus. And Paul recognized, the Apostle Paul recognized that same condition in the hearts of some of those in the church. And so in this last half of Philippians chapter 3, which we'll be studying together today, Paul says to these Philippian Christians, instead of allowing yourself to become so distracted that you lose your focus, press on toward the goal. While everyone else is talking, you run. Press on. Don't hold back and don't stop moving forward just because it's difficult or costly or risky or unpredictable. No, you press on because you weren't created for a risk-free life. You weren't given gifts and talents so that you could play it safe. You weren't blessed with resources so that you could insulate yourself from uncertainty. 
your life wasn't created for you to spend it avoiding hazard at the expense of your calling. Okay, make no mistake, God is calling each of us believers to a gospel life and that calling will always be more than we can manage on our own, always, which means it is critical that we stay focused and press on toward the goal if we've any hope of fulfilling that calling. And so in our text today, Paul tells us how to do that. He teaches us how to maintain a proper focus so that we can press on toward the goal for each of our lives. So let's turn there together now to Philippians chapter 3. We'll put it up on the screen if you don't have your Bible. And we'll pick up right where we left off last time. This is right after Paul explains that the goal for the follower of Christ is to actually know Christ, thereby becoming like Him, living like Him, loving like Him. Yes, even suffering like him, so that ultimately we can, in the words of Paul, attain the resurrection from the dead, that we may have eternal life after this life. So let's start with verse 12, and we'll read through verse 16. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do... Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So Paul says, this is what we're shooting for, guys. This is the goal, to know Jesus Christ, becoming like him, perfect, and righteous, but Paul says, listen, I'm not there yet. I'm not perfect. However, I will not let that stop me from pressing on because even though I'm not yet perfect, I belong to Christ Jesus. So I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And when Paul says, I press on, in the original Greek, that's actually a military phrase. We find it in ancient records all the way back to the 5th century uh, B.C. historian Herodotus when he was describing the Persian army's pursuit of the Greeks in battle. So this isn't just a sheer uh, grit your teeth uh, determination Paul's referring to. He's actually likening his pursuit of the call of God on his life to a military tactic, to a well thought out determined plan for pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. And so throughout the rest of this chapter, and even as he refers back to the first half that we went through a couple of weeks ago, he describes two strategies for pressing on toward the goal, even in the heat of the battle when life is bearing down on us. He says, even with all of our imperfections and all of our mistakes, with everything that we've messed up in the past, in spite of it all, how do we press on toward the goal? Paul says, one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal. In other words, don't focus on your past, okay? Because in the kingdom of God concerning our calling, there is only right now and that which lies ahead. Our calling is not behind us. It is before us. Our calling is not behind us. It is before us, which means we have to forget what lies behind and strain forward. Well, Paul, why strain forward? Why not walk forward or stroll forward? Why not ease our way forward? Why does Paul say we have to strain forward? Because the calling of God on your life will always, always, it will always be more than you can manage on your own power and ability. To pursue the call of God on your life means engaging in a battle. So we must press on in the pursuit of that calling, as Paul says, straining forward. Which is precisely why he says to forget what lies behind. Don't focus on your past, because in the past, before we were in Christ, we managed our lives for our own gain. That was the prize. Back in verses 4 through 6, Paul described himself as having position and power and respect and authority. 
he managed his life so as to bring as much gain to himself as possible. But now, now Paul says he's in Christ. Everything that he used to count as gain back there, he now counts as loss. How easy would it have been for Paul while he was being beaten, ridiculed, mocked, pursued like an animal, wrongly accused, thrown into prison multiple times? How easy would it have been for Paul to remember how it used to be, living in comfort, with influence and respect and wealth and power. How easy would it have been to pull back just a little from the strain of pressing forward toward the goal and letting things get back to how they used to be. But Paul says, I won't do it because I'm forgetting what lies behind and I'm choosing to strain forward, to press on in this battle toward the upward call of God on my life. You see, we can't live in two kingdoms. We can't live in the kingdom of light and in the, the kingdom of darkness at the same time. We can't press on toward the goal while we're focused on the past. We can't win the battle that is before us if we're still fighting the battle that is behind us. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9, 62. Peter said, for whatever comes whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they've escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. 2 Peter 2, 19 through 21. Ecclesiastes 7.10 says, Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. You see, we, we cannot press on toward the goal. We, we can't strain forward when we're focused on our past. That is the quickest way to slow or even halt your forward progress. When a, when a runner looks back, he slows down. You see, the fastest way to run is to stay focused on what is before you, not on what is behind you. And for some of us, looking back is not a matter of seeing how good we had it in the past and longing for those days. For some of us, it's not being able to let go of a very difficult or painful past that keeps us from moving forward. I understand that. When, when Paul recounts his past to the Philippians earlier in the chapter, he says in verse 8, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. In other words, Paul's not only referring back in these earlier verses to all that he did have, but ultimately he's making a point to emphasize what he didn't have back there in the past. He didn't have Christ. And so again, it can be very easy for us to focus on how broken and dysfunctional and painful and lacking our past appears to have been. But if you are truly in Christ, if you have submitted your life to him and his spirit lives inside of you, then you can now choose to forget what lies behind you and with great confidence move forward with your life in Christ. I'm telling you, no matter how bad you've messed up, no matter how much damage there is in your past, no matter how much hurt or abuse or destruction there has been, if you are in Christ, your future does not have to look anything like your past. Because when you're in Christ, you're no longer beholden to what happened in the past because in him there's freedom to move forward. In fact, he expects us to stop looking back and start moving forward toward the prize that can only be found as we press on toward the upward call of God on our lives. Do you understand? Your past does not own you. Listen to me. Do you trust me? Your past does not own you. If you belong to Christ, you're free from your past. You're free to forget what lies back there. Rubbish. Leave it back there. 
move forward in that freedom that can only be found in him. In fact, I love the way Paul says in verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way. If you read that verse in the original language, in the ancient Greek, the word mature in that verse is the Greek word teleos, which is the same adjective translated as the word perfect back in verse 12, where Paul says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. So in effect, Paul is saying, if you're really going to be perfect or mature, then you'll have to understand that you're not yet perfect or mature. In other words, none of us has it all together. None of us will ever have it all together this side of heaven until we attain that resurrection from the dead, as Paul puts it in verse 11. So stop beating yourself up. Stop focusing on your past and instead press on toward the goal, which is not behind us. It is ahead of us as we hold true, Paul says, to what we have attained, which is Christ Jesus. What a powerful message from a man who gave up everything, including his past, for the upward call of God on his life. Let's keep reading verses 17 through 21. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And so, interestingly, after making it clear that he's not yet obtained perfection, Paul says, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes focused on those who walk according to the example you have in us which seems a little strange for him to say until you continue reading as Paul juxtaposes, uh, he compares uh, those who press on toward the goal even though they're not perfect with those who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Those who he says their God is their belly, which is another way of saying those who worship themselves because their minds are set on earthly things. So again, it's not about perfection It's about focus. Paul says, don't focus on your past. And then here he says, don't focus on yourself. Don't focus on yourself like those who worship themselves do. They focus on themselves, and so they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their minds are set on earthly things, on personal gain, which is the very opposite of how Paul lives, which he tells us to imitate which is particularly striking when you look at the context from which Paul was writing this letter to the church. He's locked up in a Roman prison. I'll tell you, a Roman prison in the first century was nothing like American prison in the 21st century. Okay, Prison today, compared to ancient Rome, would have been the lap of luxury for someone like Paul. In the first century, when you were put into prison, you didn't have a whole lot of rights. You weren't guaranteed three square meals a day or clothing as you needed it or blankets as you might need them or medical care. In fact, in Paul's day, whatever care you did receive while in prison was the sole responsibility of family and friends or anyone else who was willing to visit you and bring you food and clothing and blankets and medical attention. In fact, uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, danger involved in that sometimes because people would travel great distances to get to their friends and loved ones who were in prison, carrying with them a mass amount of supplies. And in the first century, that often meant robbery and even being killed on the way. It was a very dangerous thing to travel to a prison to help your friends or your neighbors or your family members, which is exactly why back in chapter 2, Paul wrote to the Philippians to receive Epaphroditus in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. You see, that wasn't a slight or a a dig against the Philippians. They were trying to send supplies to Paul. It's simply that they weren't able to get them there. They couldn't get the relief that Paul needed to him while in prison until Epaphroditus went risking his own life in order to deliver those needed supplies from the Philippian church, which ended up keeping Paul alive. And so here is Paul suffering in prison, 
near to death at times, often hanging on to life by a thread because he doesn't have the provisions that he needs, completely dependent upon others to keep him going so that he can continue to press on toward the goal, and he's telling them to imitate him. Paul says, here I am. I've suffered the loss of all things. I'm locked up in prison, completely dependent on help from others in order to stay alive, barely making it at times. Oh, and by the way, be like me. Which is to say, don't focus on yourself. Because it's not all about us. But there were those in the church who were certainly making it all about them, which Paul is trying to warn them about. And I'm just going to tell you... If I read one more article about why people are leaving the church in America today, it's not that the information is bad. The reporting may well be accurate. So it's not the fact that people are reporting on that that's the problem. It's the answers that people are giving as to why they're leaving the church that honestly amazes me. If anyone understands that the church is far from perfect, it's the pastor I get it. We don't always get it right. There's much for us to learn and to do better. I honestly get that. And really, I think most pastors do. And despite what people sometimes think, we're not insensitive to the very, very different preferences represented in the same congregations in our churches, which happen to be incredibly diverse in age and culture and background and in expectations, even in the same congregation. And yet it seems like about every other day there's a new batch of articles explaining that if we, the church, could just learn to satisfy some demographic of people better, if we could just learn to do church the way that this group of people or that group of people wants church to be done, if we could just learn to give them what they want, then they would surely come back to church. And I hate to be the one to break it, to them, whoever they are, but all of this isn't about you. It isn't about me. All of this is about Jesus Christ and our obedience to his calling in our lives to be active members of his church. Why? So that we can accomplish, are you ready for this? His purposes, not ours. By the way, you probably know this, this isn't just a church problem today. This is a society problem. We have become so suffocatingly self-focused in our society that our bellies have become our gods. We're a culture of people who worship ourselves. We are altogether consumed with what we want. And that focus on ourselves, unfortunately, has spilled over into the church. And apparently it's nothing new. C.J. Vaughan, the 19th century English scholar, once wrote, If anything for a moment shows us to ourselves as we are, stripping off the disguise by which we commonly impose, not upon others only, but also upon ourselves, does anything strike us so painfully as this one conviction that we are predominantly earthly-minded? That was published in 1862. John Calvin wrote, Only let us look toward our mark with sincere simplicity and aspire to our goal, not fondly flattering ourselves, nor excusing our own evil deeds, but with continuous effort striving toward this end that we may surpass ourselves in goodness until we attain to goodness itself. In other words, don't focus on yourself, as so many do. Rather, press on toward the goal of the upward call of Jesus Christ. By the way, Calvin wrote that in 1536. You see, there's an aspect of human nature that is often exacerbated by human culture, but human culture in and of itself is not the the origin of this aspect of our lives, of our earthly mindedness. It's our sinful nature which means that all of us, even the most faithful Christians in the world, we all have a natural propensity to focus on ourselves. And Paul says we have to fight that urge with everything in us. And the reason that Paul was able to say to the Philippian church, imitate me, was precisely because he was imitating Christ. 
Paul was not focused on himself uh, in his letter to the Corinthian church. He said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. So you understand, Paul wasn't saying, hey, look at me because I'm all that in a bag of chips. No, Paul's saying, if you need an example on this earth of how you should live, then imitate the one nearest you who imitates Jesus. Just don't focus on yourself. Because you can't press on toward the goal if you're not focused on the goal. The moment you turn your focus on yourself, that's the moment your mind becomes set on earthly things and you lose your focus on Christ. Which is why Paul reminds them that our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. At the time of this writing, the Roman Empire had reached the culmination of its power and Philippi prided itself on being a Roman colony. In fact, for an individual in that day and time to be able to say, I am a Roman citizen, was a tremendous source of pride and privilege and status and security as Roman citizens were not only respected, but they were protected under Roman law uh, far beyond that of non-citizens. And that was not at all lost on the, the members of the church in Philippi as nationalist pride was not only pervasive in the Roman colonies, but also uh, within the churches of those Roman colonies, much like the nationalist pride that we find in much of the American church today. And so it is critical that we recognize where our true citizenship lies in heaven as we keep our focus not on ourselves, but on our Savior. Our allegiance ultimately is not to the king of this country or any other. It is to the king of kings, the one on whom we must remain focused, the one who, who Paul says will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself, which uh, is Old Testament messianic uh, language taken from the Psalms. It looks forward to that time when the enemies of the cross of Christ are subdued once and for all and his people are transformed into perfection at the resurrection. So we press on toward that goal, focused on that goal, understanding that in the meantime, we haven't yet attained that perfection which means there's an ongoing reality to this life for the Christian that we will at times have to struggle. At times, we may suffer for Christ because living for Him certainly isn't something that's always easy to do. But He hasn't called us to something that costs us nothing. He's not calling us to something that we can manage on our own. That's why we need each other. He's not calling us to something convenient or easy or safe or predictable. On the contrary, in spite of and in the midst of all of the challenges of answering the upward call of God on our lives, he is calling us to press on toward the goal. And we can. We can press on, even though it's difficult at times. We can press on because we weren't created for a risk-free life. We weren't given gifts and talents to play it safe. We weren't blessed with resources to insulate ourselves from uncertainty. And we were not created to spend our lives avoiding hazard at the expense of our calling. No. He's called each of us to maintain our focus on Him. Not on our past and not on ourselves, but on Jesus Christ alone as we together press on toward the goal. Let's pray.